All right, so we're moving into chapter 7. We only had two lectures in chapter 6, which laid the foundations for convection heat transfer. We spent two ch lectures in chapter 7 dealing with external flow, then two lectures in in internal flow, and then I think maybe only one lecture in natural convection. So we're into convective heat transfer. We're s focused on external flow. So we revisit flow over a flat plate and spend quite a bit of time on it. Then what we do is we, they could have, authors could have put this section of the textbook earlier, but they, they introduce a general methodology for convection heat transfer calculations. That's probably the best place to put it. Why? Because it can be very confusing. So here's a little bit of a road map to keep you straight. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, flow across cylinders, cylinders and cross flow, that's external, over the body of a cylinder as well as over a sphere. We do not have time to cover uh, cross banks of tubes. It's very important practically in a lot of situations in engineering, but we just don't have time in the semester. We, jets, impinging jets, it's very important. It happens a lot of places, but we just don't have time. So it's in the textbook in case you need to refer to it, as well as packed beds, maybe not as common as impinging jets or flow across banks of tubes, but it's also um, uh, important, but we're not going to cover it. So there you go. So today we're going to try to get through plat flat plates, the theory, it's a lot of material, and then we're going to talk a little bit about cylinders and spheres, and that's chapter seven. Last chapter, we are going to build on it. What do we build on? Well, we had our boundary layer equations, which are continuity, momentum, and energy, those three differential equations. We are very much interested in the shear surface shear stress, which gave us a dimensionless friction coefficient. We're going to do the same thing again. The convection, local convection coefficient, as well as an average convection coefficient, put it in dimensionless form, it's a Neusselt number. We're going to do that again. And then we'll talk about general convective uh, heat transfer correlations where you're looking for the Neusselt number as some function of the Reynolds and the Pirano. And we look at a lot of correlations today. This is the development of the Blasius velocity boundary layer solution. What are those three equations that we start with? Continuity, Continuity linear momentum, and the X and energy. Those are the three things. You look at it mathematically. I didn't put down the boundary conditions, but it looks like differential equations, partial differential equations, and in general you're looking to solve for the U and the V and the T. So it's like I'm really solving for uh, a velocity vector field in 2D and a scalar temperature field in 2D or I'm solving for three things that are coupled, potentially coupled, maybe not as strongly as they could be, but do you see that U's and V's are in each one of these equations, aren't they? And so, whoops, and so once I have the U and V as a function of X and Y, then it feeds into the solving for the temperature profile. All right, well, Blasius, that's the name of an individual who worked on it about 100 years ago or maybe a little bit more, so it's really old. Um, worked on it and they tagged his name because it's such a significant contribution in the field of fluid mechanics. So Blasius really focused on this part and what's added is when you add, add the temperature to solve for the temperature profile in addition to the velocity profile. I think we really need to understand these equations a little bit more. So so the first clicker question is, you look at these three equations. We just said what they were, continuity, momentum, energy. And true or false, A or B, A for true, B for false. These equations are limited to incompressible fluids. Is that true or false? Everybody in? Oh, let's go ahead and stop. Um, what, what's another way of saying what's an incompressible fluid? True? If the density doesn't change anywhere with time and space, it's incompressible. The density is 
constant, okay? So uh, how did we get this equation? What equation is it? Continuity. What did we assume in that to drive that equation? Didn't, didn't we start with something like time rate of change of density with uh, plus del dot rho v is equal to zero, and what happened to that steady state? You pull out the density. So, is it limited to incompressible fluids? Yes, it is. You know, when we get to natural convection, we're going to account for how the, the fluid in a high temperature region is less dense and it buoys up. But that's nowhere in these equations. Buoyancy is nowhere in these equations. All right. Um, should we try to skip one and go for this one? Here, you choose. First or second? First. First? All right, there you go. 30 seconds. True or false? These equations are limited to steady state conditions. True or false? Everybody in? Okay. So we'll stop it. Well, um, it's, you have to kind of know what we're dealing with. We're dealing with steady state. Steady state conditions, aren't we? So let's go ahead and ask this one. Are these equations as written, continuity, linear momentum, energy equation, are they limited to isothermal flow? Are they limited to isothermal flow? So we'll stop it. And let's take a look how we did. So uh, this box is too big. I wish I knew how to make it smaller. So limited to uh, isothermal flow. What would be the point of the third equation? We're trying to solve for temperature throughout the domain. It's not the same temperature. Is the temperature constant? No, the temperature is not constant. All right, this one is VH, very hard. So let's skip it. How's that? Let's do this one. These equations, as written, do not include, or I'm sorry, do include viscous dissipation effects. They do include viscous dissipation effects. Make sure everybody's in. Let's go ahead and stop. Well, what do you recall about viscous dissipation? What does that term really mean? Just like somebody might say, I don't understand the word isothermal. I don't understand the word incompressible. I don't understand the word steady state. This one's a little challenging. What's viscous dissipation? It's the uh, loss of mechanical energy through viscosity, and it shows up in our energy or heat equation, doesn't it? And so before, there was a term sitting over here. It was something like, I'm going to probably get it wrong, nu over c sub p, the first derivative of u with respect to y squared. I'm sorry if I get that wrong. But that was our viscous dissipation term. And I said, often that term is zero. That was what is, that's viscous dissipation. It's showing up in the heat equation from what? Viscous dissipation mechanical energy converted in through friction to heat. So, do, as it was written, does it include viscous dissipation? Right? All right. Uh, what other term is missing that was right in here? It was a negative with a dp infinity dx. So there's no, there's no gradient of the pressure the free stream pressure, so that's not included either. All right, I'm not going to ask this one, but I'm going to answer it. Are these equations limited to laminar flow, which means they're not valid for turbulent flow? Do you want to answer it, or do you want me to answer it? Me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> the problem with turbulent flow is, is think about at a location right here. I say at an instant in time, at an instant of time in that flow field at that location, what is the velocity at that point? And you'd say, well, it could be here, it could be there, it could be here, it could be there, it could be a lot of places. The time averaged velocity at that point is probably down the flow field. 
but the instantaneous velocity could be all over the place. Now it has a general distribution where it's more preferential so that when you do the time average it is down the axis of the flow field. We're thinking moving in the positive x direction. So right away when you're turbulent it's like ooh, I have to really have a very small time step to model that because it truly is transient. You say well I think I remember in fluid mechanics that we introduced a viscosity fudged a little bit. Maybe we introduced a turbulent viscosity. Then yeah, you can solve for the steady state, uh, average, velocity, turbulent velocity field, but you kind of fudged it. <laughs> turbulent is inherently non-steady. So did that help? Glad I didn't ans ask it, huh? All right, let's move forward. Well, Blasius did a great job. I can't thank him enough because this is tricky, this is difficult. What he did was he started with the continuity equation and he said, you know what, I'm going to introduce a stream function, psi. That's out of fluid mechanics. Once you have that stream function, it does something very special. If you can find psi, the stream function, such that the derivative of psi with respect to y is u and negative derivative of psi with respect to x is v, what is guaranteed? What's the impact on my differential equations, either the continuity, the momentum, or the energy? If I can find a stream function, it's gold in fluid mechanics because it does something very special to one of these three equations. What does it do to which of the three equations? Zeroes out the continuity equation. It automatically, it guarantees that the continuity equation is equal to zero. It, it's solved. So you restrict yourself to searching for, hey, I even said it right there. Why am I asking a question that I answer on the slide? It satisfies, guarantees the satisfaction of the continuity equation using the stream function. Now Blasius knew that. That wasn't his great contribution, but what he did was he introduced similarity variable and looking for a similarity solution function of a to the similarity variable which is the stream function divided by u infinity over nu x over u infinity square root. That's a little mathematical but what it does is it converts. First of all stream function satisfies continuity. It takes that momentum equation which is a PDE, a partial differential equation, and converts it to a ordinary differential equation. So the math is a little challenging. I thought, how am I going to package this? The book does a great job of explaining it, so I encourage you to read it. But this term u converts into df d eta. This term du dx is converted to this group of terms. Similarly, v is converted, du dy is converted, and you simplify, and you, lo and behold, you get a equation. Well, it looks pretty abstract, doesn't it? It's a simpler differential equation. It's not a partial, it's an ordinary. I'm only looking for f as a function of eta. But what order is it? Third order. How many initial or boundary conditions, how many extra conditions do I need for a third order ODE? Three. So here are my three. I didn't show the details, but they're worked out in the book, but they transform the boundary conditions to this new system. Now I have a mathematical problem. How, if you were given this, like Blasius did, how would you solve it? I want to solve for F. Try integrate, separate, integrate till you're blue in the face. Won't work. Why? What's the challenge in this one? There's a key little descriptor. When you see this term f times the second derivative of f, what does that say? It's nonlinear. And the nonlinear solution, nonlinear differential equations, the solution of those are just the wild, wild west. It's just very difficult, very challenging. If you could find an analytic solution, great. But you probably won't. Blasius didn't. So what do, you, what do you have to do if no analytic solutions available? Charge on into numerics. This is long before they had computers. So the numerics were a very detailed, tedious process, but it was doable by hand. 
And what he did was he said, the, I'm going to solve for f as a function of eta. Here's the numeric solution going all the way out from 0 out to about 7 eta. What is the solution of f? There it is. It starts at 0 and goes out to 5 point something. What about the derivative? Why do we care about the derivative? Because it's equal to u over u infinity. That's why we care. So there's the derivative, and here's the second derivative. So not only did he plot or give us f, he gave us the derivative of f and the second derivative of f. That's the solution, numeric solution, to the Blasius Brownian layer profile differential mm -hmm. equation. So you say, how far is the boundary layer? How thick is the boundary layer? How far out? Why? Well, that would be where the u over u infinity is 99%. We come down here and say, oh, df d eta is u over u infinity. Find 99%. Look over to eta. Eta is around 5. Voila. So you say eta equal to 5. Eta is y, which is the thickness of the boundary layer by the definition of eta. And you unravel it, and you get that the thickness is 5x times uh, square root, uh, where 1 over the square root of Reynolds number. That's a powerful conclusion. It's in your fluids book as well as in the heat transfer book. Then you take a look and say, I'm really interested in shear stress at the wall. I need the derivative of u at the wall. But it turns out to be the derivative, second derivative of f with respect to eta evaluated at the wall. We look over here. There it is, 0.322. We use it. We can cast this in dimensionless form. And you get a very powerful statement that the local skin friction coefficient thanks to the Blasius solution, is equal to a constant, 1 over the square root of the Reynolds number. You then look at how am I going to incorporate the solution uh, into the energy equation. Well, you introduce a dimensionless temperature difference ratio. They use T star in the book, so I tried to follow that. You take that energy equation and you look at how to transform the u term, the dt dx term, the v term, the dt dy term, and then the second derivative of temperature with respect to y, you get that equation. You look at it and you say, thankfully we already solved for f, but it's a function of eta. And now I'm looking to solve for t star as a function of eta. Here are my two boundary conditions. The first time that Blasius did this, I'm sure most people that he explained it to didn't understand what he's talking about. Like, Explain that again. Do it again. Tell me what you're doing. Why are we doing this? How is this approach? But it's beautiful in the sense that it mathematically works out. You have to approach it numerically. You solve it for numerically. And what you find is you, uh, if you're looking for the h of x, the local convection coefficient, it's a sum of terms times that derivative of t star with respect to eta evaluated at the wall, eta equals 0. That turns out to be 0 0.332 times the Prandtl number to the third. And now you get an equation. It's not quite analytic, but it's the Blasius solution to flow over a flat plate incompressible, steady, etc., and you get 0 0.332 Reynolds to the one-half Prandtl to the one-third. This is valid. There's a restriction in there that the Prandtl needs to be greater than 0 0.6. If not, then the boundary layers grow at different space, and it messes things up. I covered a lot of territory there. Its details are in the book. I could go slower, but I don't know if you would benefit that much from it. But the solution, the General solution is what's important. <clears throat> so I had to handwrite these because we don't have them typeset yet. <laughs> so uh, parade of equations. I, don't, I just use this word. Here they come. It's like a big parade. Bunch of equations. Are you interested in laminar flow? Are you interested in thickness of boundary layer, t uh, skin friction coefficient? There they are. Are you interested in thermal boundary layer? Local Nusselt number, average Nusselt number, there you go. There's a lot of equations. But most of the world isn't just laminar, is it? Most of the world is turbulent. Well, we should be able to handle turbulent flow over a flat plate. And the problem is, forget about even the simple Blasius solution. Uh, you rely heavily on experimental measurements, and they curve fit it. 
So valid for a Reynolds number above the critical Reynolds number, but not up to past where they maybe took some experiments and curve fit the data. They get a rate of growth of the boundary layer, boundary layer thickness, as well as the local friction coefficient, as well as the local Neusselt number. Whenever you see these equations, look for the restrictions. Oh, I better not use it if my Reynolds number is 10 to the 12. Well, if your Reynolds number is 10 to the 12 and your correlation is only good up to 10 to the 8, you, don't, you shouldn't use it, okay? Look for another correlation. Somebody probably published some data somewhere out there. Likewise, this, the, the correlation is based on a Prandtl number in the range 0 0.6 to 60. All right. Now that you've been exposed to the plethora, the parade, the huge number of equations, this is a good time to sit back and say, what am I going to do? How do I solve the convection heat transfer problem? In general, first, figure out what is your geometry. Are we talking flow over a plate, flow over a cylinder, flow inside a tube? And you won't be surprised that some people grab the wrong correlation because they just got the wrong geometry. Then you're going to need to calculate that Reynolds number to find out your flow regime. In order to calculate the Reynolds number, I'm probably going to need a viscosity. That's often temperature dependent. Viscosity is often temperature dependent. So if you're going to get the pro fluid property, viscosity, just go get all the properties you think you're going to need. Conductivity, slightly temperature dependent. Density, could be. Uh, some of those are temperature dependent. If they are, often you use the film temperature. We've seen that equation before. Now, why do I want to calculate the Reynolds number so I can determine what flow regime I'm in? Am I laminar or turbulent? Some cases, there's more flow regimes, but often it's the big two. You know, it's, it's either laminar or turbulent. Then think about what you're needing. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm in the laminar region. I'm looking for a local value, or I'm looking for an average value. Select your correlation on your geometry, on your Reynolds number to determine laminar or turbulent, whether or not you're looking for a, a local or an average value. Often. They can be very simple or they can be very complex. They can be nasty equations for those correlations. Then you compute the H. Why? Because you computed the Neusselt number, and the Neusselt is defined as HX, if it's X, divided by K, or the Neusselt average over L is H average L over K. Then you can unravel it to get the H. And once you have the H, the game is up in convection. A lot of work's been done. Now you can just use it to calculate Qs or delta Ts or whatever. Often think about calculating the rate of heat transfer off of that surface. So there's a general outline to approaches to solving convective heat transfer problems. Let's talk about cylinders in cross flow. Covered a lot of ground, flow over flat plate. Now we're going to talk about flow over a cylinder. Well, the flow over a cylinder isn't all that trivial. It's covered in your fluid mechanics class, but I'm going to review it. But the approach and heat transfer often boils down to so, something so simple I need to explain it to you. I didn't get a chance at the 11 o'clock class, and I felt bad afterward. Basically, the heat transfer, here it is. You can often express the average Neusselt number over a hot surface, the cylinder that's hot and subject to a different temperature fluid. That I always talk, I often like to talk about a surface that's hot and the fluid that's cold, but it works the other way just as well. So the average H over the surface, and that Neusselt number is defined in length scale for cylinder cross flow as the diameter of the cylinder. And it's a simple constant Reynolds to a power m, Prandtl to the one third power. And often you look for a table of values and you say, oh, for cylinders and cross flow, if my Reynolds number is between these two values, use this value of c and that value of m. If it's between these two, this two, this. Professor, this looks like good engineering cookbook. It sure is easy. It sure is easy. It sure does mask a lot of difficult concepts. So the heat transfer is really pretty straightforward for cylinder and cross flow. Likewise, uh, sphere and cross flow. But let's spend a little time talking about that 
cylinder and cross flow. Let's just review fluid mechanics. So grab from a NASA website. What do we have for case one? It's laminar, low Reynolds number, ideal flow, true? So it's just flowing very slowly over that cylinder. What about case two? What's happened? That U infinity has, it's, has increased, hasn't it? And then from three, hey, U infinity's increased, and four, U infinity's increased some more. So what we're doing is increasing the approach speed from all these five cases. So what happens when you start to approach? What do you develop in the backside? What are they showing you right here? It would be recirculation separation with the recirculation region, right? And then what they can be is they can uh, shed little rotating uh, vortices off the backside. And as you uh, increase it, they can become where you're shedding a bunch and it's like oscillating back and forth, or like a little tail. And then what happens here is you get uh, your, your front side, you're flowing very quickly, and then you get a large wake region where it's definitely a point of separation and a whole wake region behind. But then what happens in here? It's what is the difference? Look at the wording, laminar separated, turbulent separated. What are they getting at? Maybe NASA doesn't know what they're talking about. Nah, they know what they're talking about. What is the difference between four and five? Did we increase U infinity? Is that the trend? Yeah, sure did. So what happened between four and five, and why did they choose to use the word laminar separated than turbulent separated? What happened to the size of, what did we call this region back here? The wake region, right? What happened to the size of the wake region? Decreased. Why? Yeah, something else I'm looking for. Okay, if I have, uh, I can, often these are done with flow that has no um, inherent turbulence before it approaches the cylinder. It's nice, smooth, laminar flow. But if I have flow that is inherently got some turbulence in it, and I then try to make it go around a bend, will the turbulent flow navigate a bend better than a laminar flow? That's one of the big takeaways out of fluid mechanics. Turbulent flow helps to navigate going around the backside or bends better if it's turbulent than laminar. So what happened up in here? Well, this region in here stayed laminar, 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 and then finally it got back here, it separated, and boom. But if you can get laminar and then you increase, guess what you can get it to do? Just like flow over a flat plate. What's, what can it do? It can go turbulent. And once it's turbulent, as it then comes around the backside, it can navigate better to get on the backside and reduce the wake region. I know that's discussed in our fluids books as well. I'm going to try and now break it down a little bit. Let's focus on that low Reynolds number condition first. So we have this cylinder and cross flow. I grabbed this illustration off the internet somewhere. And we have location A, B, C, D, and E. True? Okay. What are they showing us with these blue lines? What do you call those blue lines? Streamlines. That's right. Streamlines. True? All right. Low, first clicker question. Low Reynolds number flow over a cylinder or a sphere, but the key is it's a low Reynolds number flow over an object, is also called either the Reynolds flow, Bernoulli's flow, Darcy's flow, Stokes flow, or Mox flow. All right, so let's go ahead and stop. And, well, I just grabbed here. What's the key idea? The key idea is that in you have it's called creeping motion or flow or creeping flow. It's very slow and the advective or inertial forces are small compared to the viscous forces. The Reynolds number is really, really small. And there's even a whole website, you can check it out, Wikipedia page. But sometimes those key words helps you, right? And so think about Stokes flow, that's a key word. 
So it's D, Stokes flow. All right. Now, we look at these points. I labeled them A, B, C, D, and E. And we just want to make some pressure comparison. Let's start with the, the pressure at point B. Where's that? Right there at the front of the cylinder, which is the direction of flow that way. You can see the arrows. Uh, compared to, here, let me write it out. The pressure at B compared to the pressure at point D. Where's point D? On the back side. All right. So is it greater, equal, or less? Answer A, B, or C for this Stokes flow over a cylinder. Very low Reynolds number flow. Viscous dominated flow. Inertial effects are negligible. All right, before I grade that, let me do this. Along that streamline, um, uh, could I th think about what's happening to the fluid uh, velocity along that streamline? I know it's heavily viscous, but still. Um, let's think about the velocity at point uh, A, the speed, the magnitude. Not the, I'm not thinking of vector, but just the speed uh, at point A and compare it to the speed at point B. Speed at point B. Is it greater, equal, or less? Answer A, B, or C. I should have probably started with this simpler question. Look at point A. Think about its magnitude of velocity, its speed, and compare it with point B's. All right, let's go ahead and stop. So this one, I think, was a little easier question. What do we call point B? Stagnation. It's a stagnation point. What about the velocity at point B? Zero. It's zero, right? OK, because the, the cylinder is not moving. So the velocity at point A is what's happening between A and B? What's happening to the velocity? If it's fast at A and zero speed at B, Yet it's going in the direction from A to B. What's happening to it? Accelerate or decelerate? Decelerating, true. Okay. The pressure is at point B. What is it going to be compared to the pressure at point A? Pressure is going up. The pressure is going up. True. All right. I didn't grade that previous one here, but let me do this. Let's talk about the velocity at point A and the velocity at point C. Is it greater, equal, or less? Answer A, B, or C. There's point C, it's at the top of that cylinder. You're good? Anybody else? Good? Good? So we'll stop it, all right? All right. So, uh, it speeds up as it has to go around it, doesn't it? So the velocity at C is going to be greater than the velocity at A, isn't it? Doesn't it, doesn't it speed up as it goes around? So as it speeds up, what about the pressure? I know I'm going to go back and grade this one. What about the pressure at A compared to the pressure at C? The pressure now. Is the pressure at A greater, equal, or less than at C? What does the pressure do? Pressure at A versus the pressure at C. Good, 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 good. Everybody good? All right, let's stop. Well, I heard some people talking about Bernoulli's. I know it's viscous flow, but it's still applicable, right? As it speeds up, what's happening? Pressure goes down. So the pressure is low, right? And uh, if you had asymmetry, you might have lift out of it. If you had a foil or something, but this is not a good foil. There's no asymmetry. It's symmetrical. So there's no net lift. The pressure on the top and the pressure on the bottom are lower but there's not going to be any lift or, or opposite of lift. So let's go ahead. Which one is it? A. The pressure 
at point A is greater than pressure at point C. C is a low pressure. All right, now, uh, are you ready for me to go back and grade the other question, this one? Or do you want to re-answer it? Just grade it. All right. Well, what about it? So the pressure at B is a stagnation point. What is the velocity at D? The velocity at D. It's like a stagnation point too, isn't it? Zero speed, right? But what happened was is you have complete pressure recovery at, in Stokes flow. And so the pressure at D is equal to the pressure at B. Complete pressure recovery. All right. I see some celebration back there. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, what a, talk to me a little bit about the pressure gradient here. The fluid is accelerating, true, from B to C. Is the fluid accelerating from B to C? Okay. How about the pressure gradient? Is the pressure at B higher than C? So the pressure is pushing it. It's accelerating and it's getting pushed from behind. That's a either an adverse or a favorable pressure gradient. Which term is it? Favorable. It is favorable. Why do you call it favorable? Because when you're it, it flow likes to go from high pressure to low. The pressure is a little pushing it. But just what's happening from C to D? From C to D, what's happening? Adverse pressure gradient. Well, what's that mean? That means that you're flowing in a region where you're going from low pressure to high pressure. What's the fluid going to be doing when it goes from C to D in an adverse pressure gradient? It's not going to be speeding up anymore, is it? It's going to be slowing down. It doesn't like to do that. So if it can find a way to get out of there, it will get out of there. And what happens is, is you increase the Reynolds number. When you increase the Reynolds number, what happens here? What do they call this point in the adverse pressure gradient? The S point. What is that S word? Separation point. And then you get a little recirculating region back in here. And the boundary layer detaches, or the flow detaches. It's the separation point. All right. As you then continue to increase the Reynolds number, or you increase U infinity if your mind likes that, then you get the separation point moves further up, doesn't it? Closer to the top. But now, if it's all laminar, it has a hard time navigating in that adverse pressure gradient, and so it, it likes to separate, and you get a largest wake region. But if you increase the flow speed even some more, then you can get it to trip. It'll be laminar in the beginning, but it'll be turbulent before it has to get into that adverse pressure gradient region. The turbulence helps it navigate reduces or pushes back the separation point, reduces the size of the wake. Now, if I'm thinking of forces to hold that cylinder in place, that force has to overcome the drag force. There's two components to the drag force on the cylinder. What are the two components? Uh, viscous and pressure or form drag. Those are the two terms. So what happens when this wake region the wake region has a large low pressure on the backside, hence it has a large form or pressure drag, not as big a viscous. But when you decrease the size of the wake region, the net form drag goes down on that cylinder, doesn't it? So the net force, the drag force, net drag force on it goes down. And that's why we have dimpling on golf balls. If you pass fluid mechanics and you still don't know why, you have dimpling on golf balls, please research it. Do not come out of a match, bachelor's of mechanical engineering program and know why there's, and not know why, and not be able to explain why there's dimpling on golf balls. 
Why is there dimpling on golf balls? The surface roughness helps promote earlier turbulence at a lower Reynolds number. The earlier turbulence helps it navigate to reduce the wake on the backside. A lower drag force for the same speed through the air. So when you hit it, it goes further. It goes further because there's a that drag. And so the golfers love it. Man, you hit it and it goes flies and flies and flies. All right. So that's why you have dimpling on golf balls. Hopefully everybody already understood that. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you next time.